Hello everyone and a very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, thank you for joining us today at the Study UK uh, virtual fair on 21st August. We are delighted to have you here with us. I hope you're having a wonderful time at the fair. Please do visit as many universities as you can. Um, and uh, thank you also for coming to this seminar. Uh, we have two seminars today. Uh, there will be one uh, around studying and living in the UK where you can also meet some alumni and parents and ask them all the questions you want. And uh, we also have this one, which is uh, by UKVI on UK student visas policy and process. Um, unfortunately, Harry could not be with us today live, but we've uh, managed to record this for all of you. So I hope you find it useful. I um, am delighted to present Harry Booty, UKVI International Communications Lead. Um, Harry, thank you so much for doing this. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm sorry you couldn't be here today, but thank you for recording this for us and um, take it off. Great. Thank you, Achi. Uh, it's always good to join this event, however format we deliver it. Um, as per usual, I'll go through the standard updates in terms of uh, in terms of UKVI, uh, the student visa and graduate route, as well as travel rules around at the moment around um, entering the UK during coronavirus. Uh, that'll take about 10 minutes and then we'll do uh, uh, some of the most commonly asked questions that we're being asked at the moment in August uh, about about student visas and traveling to the UK. I'll turn my camera off to deliver the presentation, but then I'll be back uh, on, on screen to discuss the questions. So in terms of I always start with numbers. Uh, and they are strong for, for Indian nationals and indeed many other countries in both South Asia and the world. Uh, we've seen a 13% increase in student visas in this financial year compared to last year, which is despite the pandemic. So during that 12 months between April 2020 and March 2021, which was the year most hit by the pandemic, more and more Indian students have chosen to go to the UK, which is really obviously fantastic news. We know it's uh, uh, we know students are still looking for places to study and still looking to uh, not put their education on hold despite the challenges we face. And this is a vote of confidence in the UK, which we really welcome. <clears throat> this builds on a, uh, a four year trend of really strong numbers for India. Uh, back in 2017, there were just 11,000 students going to the UK. Now there are 56,000, so uh, about five times more which again is really fantastic news for UK, fantastic news for Indian students who are going to the UK, and hopefully we'll continue to see this number grow in the coming months and uh, years. I'm sure we will. And you as Indian students will know that there are many of your fellow, fellow Indian nationals who are there uh, already studying and able to provide feedback, provide advice, and sort of uh, show you the way for your own journey to the UK. So in terms of what we look for in a student visa, it's pretty standard uh, and this hasn't changed much in many years. We have three key principles as well as some supplementary principles. You have to be offered a place at an educational institution. Uh, that's usually a university, but not always. Uh, and a place that would be a CAS, a confirmation of acceptance of studies. You have to be able to speak English as required by a university and you have to be able to support yourselves financially. Uh, those are the three main requirements. And I'll go into more detail there, as well as a couple of other additional requirements, which uh, we also look for from for applicants from this part of the world. So everyone will know you have to provide a current passport that is valid for travel. It does not necessarily need to be valid for your whole duration of your time in the UK. For example, if you're going for a three year course, you might renew your passport during that course. However, it should be valid for the trip and initial time in the UK. You also need a CAS letter, Confirmation of Acceptance of Studies. That's a digital uh, certificate nowadays or digital letter and it will set out um, what you're studying, where you're studying it, the academic requirements and the English language requirements. And it will also confirm the uh, that you have been offered a place to study. You need that cast to apply for the UK visa. Uh, you, you will also like to require most of these documents, but not all of them. Everyone will require some sort of proof of finances, uh, for example, uh, proof of funds, sponsorship or bank loan. You'll need educational documents and proof of English. Again, I'll go into that in a, more, a bit more detail. 
and everyone from India and indeed South Asia and many other countries will need a tuberculosis test result uh, from an approved TB test centre provider. This is uh, this is mandatory. There's a list of TB centres on gov.uk, so do check that out. But that's something very much to check out uh, to make sure you do before you go to the uh, visa application centre. You may also need proof of consent and relate or relationship with your parent or legal guardian, such as a stepfather or stepmother, if you're under 18, or if you are uh, relying on parental finances, you may also need that. And many people, sorry, some courses will need an ATAS certificate. Uh, usually it's a minority of people. Uh, for example, people who are studying courses such as aerospace engineering, uh, nuclear physics, and other of those sorts of scientific and engineering courses. So it's it's a small percentage of students who need the ATAS, Academic Technology Approval Scheme Certificate. But if you do need it, this is your primary thing that you must get before you apply for your visa. So it's a very key issue if you do need ATAS, but if you do not need ATAS, you do not need to worry about that. In terms of funds, uh, two principles here in these bullets. First is that you must uh, provide Evidence that you can pay course fees, that's the full fee if it's a one year course or the first year if it's a multi year course. And then additionally, you pay uh, an additional maintenance, you show an additional maintenance fee uh, for depending on where you are. London is more expensive than the rest of the country, so you have to show a higher amount of funds there. Whereas the rest of the UK, regardless of whether it's England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, North, South, rural, urban, it is £1,023 for each month up to a maximum of nine months. So in practice, you're looking at about £9,000, £9,200 if you're studying outside the UK, which is about nine lakh thereabouts on current exchange rate, and about just over £11,000 if you're studying in London. That's in addition to whatever your course fee is. Though that, that combined total, course fee plus maintenance, must be in your account for 28 days consecutively prior to your online application form submission. And you, many people will show this through cash and savings account. That's in your name as a student or the parent or legal guardian's name. You can have a loan and you can have sponsorship as long as it's fully approved and you show evidence that it has been approved again by the time you submit your visa. In terms of the process, uh, you make your application online. Everyone does that nowadays and you pay your immigration health surcharge and the visa fee at that point. You then choose one of our visa centres uh, run by VFS to submit any documents uh, possibly interview, but but we don't interview many people anymore, and submit biometrics as well as your passport, so fingerprints and what have you. Uh, most of our visa centres are open, and they're open across all Tier 1 cities, Mumbai, Delhi, Bangalore, Chennai, Hyderabad, Pune, Calcutta, uh, Chandigarh, Jalandhar, and most of these also have priority visa service, which is five working days. Uh, otherwise, the standard process is 15 working days, and after that three week period, 15 working days, not including weekends, you'll get a decision back from UKVI. If you're approved, we'll place a 90 day visa within your passport. Most of you will be approved because Indian approval rates are very high. Uh, and we will place that visa in your passport and that gives you three months to travel to the UK. If you're refused, we will give you a letter by email which tells you why you've been refused and how you can apply again if, uh, if that is what you want to do. In terms of the graduate route, uh, the, here are the key principles. So the first is that it is open. It's been open for over a month and we have received thousands of applications already, including many from India and South Asia. And it will be open by the time you, for you when you go to the UK from September or even later if you're thinking about a future year. Uh, the, the, it will, for most of you, it will be two years long. Uh, if you're doing an undergraduate course or a master's course, it'll be two years. However, you can have three years if you're doing a PhD course, a doctoral course, uh, in which case it's three years. That's the only distinction. It's either two years or three years. Uh, the fee will be £700 regardless of the length of the visa. And the IHS is also payable, uh, immigration health surcharge, which is £624 uh, a month, a year. Uh, and then if it's a two year graduate route, you pay two times that, for example. Uh, you don't need to be sponsored either by your university or by your employer. You just need to complete your course and apply for your student visa. Sorry, apply for your graduate route whilst you have a valid student visa and are inside the UK, which is uh, really key. You, you can you have to do it from inside the UK. 
but you can start working as soon as you complete your studies whilst on a student visa and then continue working on a graduate route uh, visa and that is completely legal and completely fine and you do not need formal support from a, an employer or you do not need like a letter of endorsement from your university to do this you just must complete your studies and complete your course uh, another key update um, india is now amber listed which is the middle rank in terms of our travel requirements for covid uh, which is great news that ca that happened on sunday the 8th of august and uh, of course we keep this under review but as of time of recording this is where india is and this means that many students indeed already are traveling and instead of having to stay in a government approved hotel um, which is the, the the highest level and india was on this level for four months you now still have to quarantine but you must uh, you, you can choose where to quarantine you can do that at home or at university halls or at a relative's house or anything like that we do not tell you where to quarantine we just say that you have to if you're staying in england you can uh, pay for a, an additional test on the fifth day of your quarantine under the test to release scheme and you can leave quarantine after those five days but regardless of whether you do that you have to do two tests before uh, you, you have to do a test before you travel book two tests before you travel and then take two tests in the uk after you arrive on day two and day eight so you will do a minimum of three tests in your journey to the uk one before you travel up to three days before you travel and two after whilst you're quarantining and you can pay for a fourth test on the fifth day of your quarantine to leave after five days the test release scheme only applies in england so if you're in scotland wales or northern ireland under amber list rules currently you must complete a full 10-day quarantine you have no option to shorten there everyone also must uh, complete a passenger locator form which is a digital form that you fill out up to three days before you travel and that basically just says uh, how to contact you where you're staying and um, where you're coming from and what what how what transport you use to get to the UK uh, it is that's also a key health requirement you will you may be asked for evidence of where you're quarantining of your COVID testing status and that you've completed the passenger locator form uh, you may be asked this either by the airline when you board your flight or by UK uh, border force officers when you enter the UK at, at Heathrow or another airport so please do make sure to take part of it it's fantastic news that India is now amber listed that makes it much more uh, flexible for Indian travelers to to go including students and uh, but it is still it is not a removal of quarantine requirements it is a home quarantine instead of the hotel quarantine and finally in terms of if any other uh, sort of south asian audiences were asking again at the time of recording uh, all other uh, major countries in south asia are also are still red listed so pakistan nepal bangladesh sri lanka uh, are red listed as well as the maldives uh, which means you still have to book for pay for and enter the government approved hotel uh, service mandatory quarantine service as we call it but just in terms of general advice as i've said the main things we look for in an application are that you've got an approved offer you can speak english to the standard required to study in the uk and you can cover the costs of your course and your life in the uk during your course that is showing that you meet those requirements is how you make a good visa application Conversely, obviously not meeting those requirements may lead to a challenging visa application, which we encourage students to address. So lack of English language ability, lack of clear funding, um, obviously false documents, all of that. Uh, things like for or, or non-disclosure of travel history, things like dishonesty or fake information is of course uh, a serious issue. But things such as um, study gaps or uh, uh, personal situations around when you've studied or what you're looking to do it is not automatically a reason to be rejected we just expect you to show that you are genuinely intending to study in the UK that you meet the academic language and financial requirements to do so and we, we understand that there's lots of different ways people do that there's not a one-size-fits-all approach uh, but obviously we just expect people to be clear honest and um, complete in the information that they provide us uh, so that's fine. So that largely covers my final slide as well. Uh, we just encourage people to prepare, apply as soon as advanced as you can. Um, be able, if you are interviewed, be able to sort of explain and um, 
discuss your course, why you chose that institution, uh, what your career ambitions are in the UK. And we always encourage you to touch base with the university. They're very uh, committed to India. They really want to support students from India and indeed the rest of the region at this time. And uh, they are uh, they have teams available to offer support, particularly during the challenging particular situation at, at the moment. So do get in touch with them. Uh, we work with universities under the British Council to help offer support and guidance. And I'm sure that most of you will not have any issue in uh, getting your visa and traveling to the UK. So that's all I have to say. And then we can go into some of the questions now. That was really useful, Harry. Thank you so much. I have just cobbled together some questions which are um, quite typically popular. Um, so if we can just go through those very quickly. Um, and I hope that was useful to everybody. Um, pretty much covers everything. Uh, and I think that my questions will also cover some of these again. Uh, but let's still go through them. Uh, I'm missing Harry's. Harry, I'm missing your video. Oh, uh, it's available. Yeah. There you are. Really. Okay. Um, so this one's been quite popular this year. Uh, I can imagine with the pandemic and, you know, uh, people traveling so far away from home at this time. So can one travel with family on a student visa? Yes. Uh, they have to apply for separate visas, of course, but we are accepting those visas and many, many Indian students and and well, many of our international students who bring their family. Uh, student dependent visa is the visa that you apply for. Um, there are additional requirements such as mainly the two main requirements are an additional financial requirement. It's less than the main student, um, but you still have to show a certain amount of funds depending on how many dependents are coming and, and whether they are spouse or child and also obviously you have to show the relationship for example between a husband and wife to, to show that dependent status there are there may be different additional requirements for example tb testing and stuff like that yes it's possible and yes we accept it uh, a dependent is defined as a husband or wife a spouse um, or a child under the age of 18. Um, okay. we only accept children under, over the age of 18 as dependents if they are um, depend if they are still medically or uh, situationally dependent on the parent in some way. In most cases, it would all be under 18. Uh, so yeah, and that's how we accept it. But we're accepting those applications. Uh, priority visa is available for these applications and it's and it's very common amongst uh, international students and Indian students in particular. So it's not, uh, not a rare situation. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Um, so uh, coming to the graduate route very quickly, uh, why why has UK kind of introduced the graduate route and how does one actually go about applying for it? You did mention that one should apply for it while they still have the student visa. It has to be done from within the UK. But what's the actual mechanism of applying? Sure. Uh, so we've introduced it because uh, we wanted to improve our offer for international students. UK has got a plan called the International Education Strategy, which uh, basically means we want to get more students to choose the UK. I think up from about 440,000 international students globally choose the UK. I think in 2020, by 2030, we want that, or 2019 more likely, uh, by 2030, we want that to be uh, 600,000. So a big increase. Um, we know post study work rights is a huge part of that, a part of the offer, a part of the cost benefit analysis that students make, um, part of the way they may earn some money back or build experience or build lives in the UK. And we felt that our offer justified improvement. So now we're offering the two year post study work uh, offer, which was uh, really well received and uh, is sure to sort of add to the UK attractiveness. Uh, in terms of how you apply for it, it's a separate application to the student visa, but in many ways it's part two to your application for the student visa, because you have to have your student visa to apply for it. Uh, but because you've gone through the student visa process, you do not need to necessarily go through all the same requirements. For example, you do not need to show English language or financial requirements at the graduate route stage because you have already shown you can speak English and you can uh, support yourselves in the UK at the student visa stage. Uh, in terms of applying, you apply after you've completed your course and before the end of your student visa whilst you're inside the UK. Uh, 
all students will now uh, now get four months as part of their student visa. So they get their they get the visa for the duration of their course plus four months at the end, like a wrap up period. Uh, we would expect most people to apply for the graduate route between those uh, two two dates, the end of the course and the end of the student visa. Uh, you apply online, like um, like all visas nowadays, or almost all, and then you uh, pay your fee and your immigration health surcharge again, like normal. But then instead of going to a visa centre in the UK, you are redirected to download an app called the UK Immigration ID Check app, and you download that and then you submit your biometrics, so a photo fingerprint and other information via the app. The two bits of information that we look for is a uh, is your BRP reference. So your basically your BRP card, which is the long term ID card that you get after you go to the UK. Uh, that is has a microchip in it and the app can read the information in that. So you can basically get the app to read the information and it tells about your immigration history. So that's step one in terms of that. And the other thing you enter your um, CAS reference number, which you will get when you've been given an offer to institution. Keep that CAS reference number. That's your like um, that's your identity within the UK education system. And then when you come to apply for the graduate route, you submit that reference as well. So you submit all of that digitally, uh, and then the UK officer in who will be looking at the application will be able to use your BRP reference to pull up your immigration history and say, right, okay, this person. Um, obeyed immigration law, did not break any laws, all fine. And then they would pick up your um, your CAS reference and they would say, OK, this student attended their lectures, they completed their course. And it's those two bits of information that we look for and that's it. We wouldn't expect, like I say, financial or other requirements on top of that. Uh, finally, you, you must be in the UK and we are encouraging everyone to use the digital process. This is how we are we intend our immigration system to be fully digital by 2025 so this is our like first steps towards that uh, but that if your phone doesn't work or you don't have access to it or anything like that you can still visit a visa application center in the uk so yeah so we want we want and intend it to be digital for most people but there will be a, a backup option if you don't have that access that's really useful and very detailed thank you harry um when when should one start applying for a student visa you know if they are i don't know let's say they are starting their course in september 2022 when should they apply when should they start the process so we uh reformed the student visa a bit last year actually so now you can apply six months before you start so if you're say going in september uh, 22 you can start applying from march 2022 and we would encourage people to apply early. I mean, it's visas are a necessary process, of course, but I, I, I get as much as anybody else that they're not there. They're not the thing that people look for. They're looking for their plan to study in the UK, what courses are going to take, who they're going to meet, how they're going to make friends, what places they're going to visit. The visa is a means to an end. So if you can get the process out of the way, do it and then that would be fine. So if you have, for example, funding or an offer in place uh, well in advance, you can do that six months in advance. We would advise all students probably to uh, leave at least a month before their date of travel uh, because it takes. We acquire from VFS uh, the, that between your online form and your appointment at the visa center, there must be maximum a week, five working days. So it can take up to a week to get an appointment and it can take up to three weeks to get a student visa back. You can pay for priority visa to get it in one week. Uh, so that would shorten the whole process to up to two weeks, but particularly at highly busy times such as uh, the student peak in late August and September. Um, it can still be quite pressured, so I would encourage you to leave a month. Pay for priority visa service if you feel like you want a faster service, but it's not mandatory. And then yeah, leave a month before you travel uh, to apply for it. That's good. Um... I think now there are a few quick ones. Uh, does one need, does one have to interview? No, no vast majority won't be interviewed. Uh, we do, we, we retain the right to interview, so you, it's possible, but it's a small percentage of students uh, and, and it's decreasing as well. Uh, we interview for two reasons, either uh, because we want to check something in the application, just to be clear about what you put, or to 
uh, almost like a sample of the student. So it may just be that reason. Uh, so if you are to, are to be interviewed, you shouldn't need to worry as long as you can explain your history and your plans to the UK and all of the aspects of your application, then it should be fine. Uh, yeah, we, we, I know that we often get feedback that interviews can be quite intimidating, but the visa officer isn't looking to like sort of lay traps for you. If you can go in, yeah. speak English, explain your course intentions, explain how you intend to build a career in the UK or you want to start a business in a certain sector, any of those sort of um, personal plans for you and your sort of ability to speak English and all of that sort of stuff and, and, and do your course. That is um, that's the best way to prepare for an interview, but yeah. the majority of people won't be interviewed. That sounds good. Um, but what if somebody is refused a visa and uh, what can they do after that? Yeah, so uh, I think only about four or five percent of people are refused, so the vast majority aren't, which is good. Uh, if they are refused, we will send a letter via email. We don't send physical letters anymore. We send a letter by email to the email you provided in the application form uh, and you'll be able to get that and it will say specifically why you've been rejected. You've been rejected under what specific part of the immigration rules. Uh, for example, not providing sufficient evidence of funds or not providing the required evidence that the university asks for language ability or anything like that. Um, unless, unless there has been a judgment that you've provided false documents, for example, a forged bank statement, in which case there may be a ban on reapplying, which is again a small percentage of cases. You can apply again if you feel that you now have the evidence to reapply, or if you feel that the UKBI did not uh, take into account your evidence, you can ask for administrative review or AR, which is a, which is a process that uh, basically asks them to reassess the application and consider the evidence that you felt you submitted. If UKVI have made a mistake or you genuinely think that UKVI haven't acknowledged a document that you did include, then that's AR's view. However, if you if, if the mistake was on your side or you just did not include sufficient information or anything like that, um, then you may need to apply again. But unless you have committed active wrongdoing, for example, uh, lying or providing false documents, then you are perfectly entitled to apply again. To know. Um, okay, so uh, how how if if the pandemic should kind of continue, uh, we obviously hope not. How would that affect the visa application process? And you know, for example, if the results of students don't come in by the time they need to apply for a visa, what would they do? What are some of these challenges that can that one can face, and you know, how does one mitigate those? So we've been processing student visas as well as other categories of visas such as skilled work visa um, throughout the red listing uh, April was on uh, sorry India was on the red list between April and August 2021 and we are processing student visas throughout that time um, and and many students did choose to go uh, and then indeed further back we have been largely processing student visas for almost all the time across all of India since we first reopened from the first major national coronavirus lockdown in uh, June July 2020. So we have been getting through the pandemic whilst we have, for example, on the red list, we have restricted visit travel. We have been uh, supporting students throughout. So I would say it's highly likely, regardless of what the future holds, that it will be possible to apply for student visas um, and travel. In terms of um, second part of your question, which was about, remind me, sorry. Results, uh, you know, if okay, students yeah, results. Result. So, yeah. Yeah, we're well aware of all the sort of um, cancellation of board exams and all of that. Um, it, it is not necessarily an issue for your visa application. UK immigration rules say that um, we require to see the academic documents that your university accepts for your place onto your course. So speak to your university. Again, they're very aware of the situation. And if they, for example, accept you on the basis of provisional results or a teacher assessment or some other way of assessing a student's ability, in lieu of the board cancelled, uh, then UKBR would accept the same information. What it comes down to is when the university issues your CAS, they will put what they, the academic document they require on your CAS. So if your university have accepted and done that for the CAS, then we will accept the same document. Excellent. And I, you know, we've seen that students have been able to travel in the last uh, year, so it, sh it should be absolutely fine. Um, what about students who are on scholarships? 
uh, what sort of evidence do they need to show for their visa finances? Uh, so they just have they have to show evidence of that scholarship, which is a bit of a, a vague answer, but it's it's there's many scholarships. They're quite diverse. Uh, you have to show that the scholarship is fully approved and and not pending, and uh, that it covers the the fee and living costs. So partial scholarships are also a thing. So you might get 50% of your course fee paid. That's also fine. In that case, you would need to show the evidence of the scholarship and then evidence of uh, personal funds to cover the remaining cost of the course and maintenance fees. So yeah, if it's a full scholarship, you just need to show full official evidence of that scholarship from, from the sponsorship body. And then if it's a partial scholarship, you show evidence of the scholarship plus funds for the remaining. But either way, it's fine. It's just the key point is that the scholarship must be uh, completely approved by the time you come to apply for the visit visa. Yep, and just kind of wrapping up now, uh, last couple of questions. Uh, what are the things that the student needs to have ready before they start applying for their visa? You know, what are those three or four things, you know, if they have those ready to apply? Uh, so you, you'll need your CAS. Naturally, that's like the, you can't make a student visa without it, so you need that. Uh, you will need your finance uh, information, uh, which will be uh, pretty, uh, it'll, it'll depend on the exact situation, but you'll need to be able to show you that you can pay for your course and your maintenance costs. Um, you'll need whatever academic documents the university requires, uh, and they'll say this on the cast, we require the same. And likewise, for English language documents, you will require, uh, they will, the university will say how they've assessed your English. For example, that might be IELTS, or that might be uh, an, an in-house in assessment by the university. But again, however the university have assessed your English, we require the same evidence of that. Uh, so, uh, so the CAS, the evidence of English as assessed on the CAS, the evidence of academic ability as shown on the CAS, finance requirements, whether that's sponsorship, scholarship or private funds and meeting those requirements. And then finally, everyone will require the TB test um, from an approved UKBI provider. Those are the five things that people have to check. And then, of course, you may require additional stuff such as an ATAS certificate or a parental consent form, but that is not going to be for all students. That's just if students are in that situation. And as always, we advise uh, students to check with their university or check with their um, agents if they're using them about this guidance uh, because, yeah, there, there may be a, there may be additional information or individual stuff they need to provide, but overall, it's those five things we want. That's really useful. Um, for students who kind of want to know more about, you know, visas and applying and the graduate route, um, I know that, you know, the British Council, we, got, we, we are constantly doing Facebook lives and programs with UKBI, so do keep a watch out on our website and our Facebook pages to see uh, when you can meet UKBI again and, you know, have more of your questions answered. Uh, but anything else um, Harry students can do to make sure they're kind of in touch with you and they know the latest? Uh, mainly by British Council is good, also by the UK and India pages, which we monitor or any of the other UK uh, accounts, for example, in any of the cities, Mumbai, Chandigarh, uh, Bangalore, we also have accounts there, or any other country like uh, Bangladesh, Nepal, or, or any, indeed any country, we put out student guidance via that. Um, otherwise, gov.uk is a source of all the information, there's a whole section on student visas and graduate route, um, and yeah. So that, that's the guidance there as well. But otherwise, yeah, I'm sure we'll be doing this again soon uh, yeah. and uh, hope to see people there. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Harry, for doing this. Um, thank you for recording this for us. And um, I hope all of you found it useful and I hope you're finding the fair really useful. Um, the fair is going to be on for a few more hours. So do go around and see as many universities as you can. We have 30, uh, we have um, yeah, 35 UK universities at the fair. So do uh, have a very good time. And thank you, Harry. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's been wonderful, wonderful talking to you as okay. always. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all. Bye. Bye.